So my part of the talk today is going to be about, I, I'm the meta person, I'm talking the big picture. And um, as a history major, I was a, as an undergraduate, I was a history major. That's something I actually like talking about. Um, so I'm calling my part of the talk, uh, Chemicals Have Consequences. Because I don't think we really have connected the dots when it comes to chemicals, and that's what I want to talk about today. So um, I um, became interested in pesticides, actually, originally because my cat has asthma, and every time neighbors would put pesticides on their plants, on their yards or something, my my cat would start to cough. And so I began looking into pesticides quite some time ago. But I became a beekeeper, and this is my first beehive um, three years ago. I'm not a very good beekeeper, right? I have a lot to learn. Um, but that's my first hive as I was putting it together. And uh, this, these are my beehives last August. And um, you can't see the bees very well. They're, they, they were alive and thriving that day. Um, but um, that's, those are my two beehives, and those are the only two that I have. This is my bees the first day that I, um, um, not the first day, the first months after I put my first beehive in. They're doing pretty well. That hive lasted three years. These are my bees closer up, um, and um, photos taken by Steve Welter, by the way. Um, and uh, they, were, they were fun to know and work with. I'm going to stop here because my bees um, died. Um, they died here in March. Both hives just collapsed pretty quickly. Um, there's all kinds of reasons my bees might have died. <clears throat> I could blame it on all kinds of things. My next door neighbor did coincidentally, or maybe not coincidentally, apply pesticides to his yard on March 19th. Um, and my bees very quick, I'm not going to connect that directly, right? Um, soon after, in the latter days of March, my two beehives collapsed completely. They were doing fine. Uh, about March 10th, I fed them. That was the last time I fed them some sugar water. Um, and, uh, and then they collapsed. Okay, so those are my bee, my bee concerns. And um, you probably have heard that neonicotinoid pesticides, systemic pesticides, have been linked to massive bee deaths. The numbers are like 50%. For me, the number is 100%. But um, the number is overall across the country anywhere from 50 to 60% of beehives are collapsing. Sue, um, my partner at PPAN and other things, is going to talk much more about that. I want to talk about, as I say, the bigger picture. I don't know if you all know that 5 billion pounds of biocides are used every year in American land, private and public. 5 billion pounds of biocides. So that's herbicides, um, pesticides. They are everywhere. They're in plants. They're in seeds. Um, and you don't even know it because uh, plants have been treated. I don't even know it. Plants that I buy have been treated. Um, I'm pretty sure I stung my bees a couple years ago when I bought some hyssop. I'm pretty sure it had been treated with um, neonicotinoid. Um, and, you know, that didn't singly kill them, but it certainly didn't help them. Um, we know that the, what neonicotinoids do is they, they weaken the bees. Um, they act like sort of an AIDS, if you will. They don't actually kill the bees necessarily. They can, but they usually weaken the bees, and something else kills them. Okay? And Sue's going to talk more about that. But what I'm more concerned about and want to, you know, sort of talk with you all about today is the fact that pesticides and chemicals have become such a norm in American culture, <clears throat> and they are totally accepted. And I don't want to demonize the pesticide users, okay? Because for one thing, it's far too many people. I also don't think it's, um, I don't think it's useful to demonize. We've been doing that a lot in our culture for the last, I don't know, 35 years. And you see where we're getting. <laughs> we're not getting very far. Um, we're, um, we're yelling at each other about all kinds of things. My favorite aunt uses pesticides on a regular basis. She uses herbicides. She's in love with Roundup. She thinks it's the greatest thing that was ever invented, okay? Um, if she can get rid of a bunch of aphids by dumping a chemical on it, she's going to do it. She's a lovely person. You would like her. You would really like her fried chicken. She's a wonderful person, okay? And I don't go lecture her about pesticides. That's, that's not a useful conversation to have, but she really believes in them. She was born in 1932, okay? And I, and, and I think that's significant, right? Our parents, I don't think anybody was born in 1932 in here, right? But our parents, our grandparents in some cases, grew up with lots of chemicals, and chemicals had great promise for them. They were told that chemicals would have a whole lot of promise for them by really big companies. And what I want to show you is what they grew up listening to, and maybe, what you grew up listening to. I remember a little bit of this. Maybe you will as well. I want to start, this is the 1930s, okay? This is 1936 is when this came out. So my aunt is, you know, my mother is two, my, my aunt is four. So they're not watching this and they're pretty poor, so they're not going to movie theaters to watch trailers like this. Anyway, nonetheless, this is what America was watching back then, okay? And I want to just warn you that this is, um, um, it's uh, going to be kind of grainy. 
and it's going to be garbled at one point, and I may not let it go on too long. Better things for better living through chemistry. It's garbled at points. Wood, coal, lump, water, oil, cotton, and many others. Until a short time ago, these things were used, just as they had been used for generations past. But in recent years, science took a... The farm, the mine, the forest, even the air and the sea were called upon to contribute basic raw materials in response to chemistry's never-ending study and continuing research. And every year, DuPont buys from the farm, from the mine, and the... So if, if you're um, a person who's alive today, which all of you are, right? You're looking at those images and you're going, ew, right? Um, in ni the 1930s, people weren't saying ew. They were very excited about this. The 1930s was when antibiotics come along, um, and antibiotics you know, have helped cure these massive human problems like the plague. <clears throat> the plague killed far more people than all of humanity's wars put together, right? Yeah. Pneumonia. Um, war wounds themselves, syphilis, um, uh, tuberculosis, which was a big killer in the 19th century, and the reason my relatives came to Colorado in 1887, because they, they were from Illinois, and they were all dying of tuberculosis. They came to Colorado, and they got better. Um, so in the 1930s, those images, and also if you think about the bigger picture of the Soviet Union, right, you know, we're competing with them, we have factories, they don't. That particular um, uh, um, little news clip put together by DuPont um, made America look big and successful, and chemicals were a solution. I have um, another one for you, and this one is blessedly short, um, but it's, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> this is by DuPont as well. This is from 19... So we could talk about DuPont a little bit, right? DuPont brings you Liberty Link seeds. That's the genetically modified corn um, that's dipped in neonicotinoid and planted all across America. It might be being planted today, actually, out on the Eastern Plains. Um, it's, and DuPont is responsible for a lot of genetically, mo genetically modified foods and such. Um, genetic modification is not necessarily killing bees. It's the neonics that genetically modified seeds are dipped into that is a, a, a much bigger problem. Um, in any case, though, I mean, Mont Monsanto is considered the big GM company. Don't forget DuPont, right? DuPont spent a lot of money, and so did Monsanto, and so did Bayer and Syngenta, and these other companies that have been around quite a while, convincing America that chemicals are really important, that we can't live without chemicals. And I want to make clear I'm not anti-chemical, okay? I like plastic. It's a very convenient thing. Um, and I'm, you know, I really like antibiotics. I'd like it if they would continue to work for us, right? But... Um, there are, what we've done in our culture is we have decided that, well, okay, if chemicals work so well over here, they're probably going to work over here as well. Got a problem, throw a, chem throw a chemical at it. And uh, one of the, well, you, I can go back, we can go back, we can go back to the poison gas in World War I. Um, that seemed like, okay, we got soldiers, we got land, we don't want to destroy the land, just destroy the soldiers. Let's try poison gas, right? Darn it, they wafted back on our own soldiers, right? Germans started it, um, the Allies continued it. And there was that problem, okay, that the enemy soldier died, but so did your soldiers, right? And they coughed up their lungs before they did. Poisons were used for all kinds of things. Chemicals were used for all kinds of things during the Second World War. I'm not going to talk about the Holocaust here, but if you know much about that, you know that chemicals were key to um, all kinds of things in the Second World War, and especially the Holocaust. We dump artificial fertilizers and other chemical on crops because it increases yields. 
Um, and these artificial fertilizers are, are killing our, our waterways and there's a large dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico because of those chemical uh, fertilizers. Uh, we throw antibiotics at everything. We use it to fatten up our animals and we have antibiotic resistance going on right now. We threw DDT at mos mosquitoes. It seemed like a, a reasonable thing to do. My father was in, the second, was in the Philippines during the Second World War, and every night he would spray DDT into his mosquito um, netting and climb in and sleep there. We don't know what that did to him, but it probably did something. Um, and, you know, and of course DDT did kill birds and such. We threw Agent Orange on the jungles of Vietnam because it's going to kill the, uh, you know, the, the foliage and then reveal the enemy, um, but it also sickened a lot of Vietnamese um, civilians and of course it's sickened a lot of American soldiers as well. Napalm, first used during this first, this, uh, the Second World War, napalm was what caught fire and we used it during the fire bombings. Um, and then the second, and during Vietnam we used it just directly on people. Um, and it became one of the one of the, the big symbols of the Vietnam War. Um, inflammable chemicals are everywhere. They're in our pillows. They're in our couches. They're everywhere. It was the solution to smoking in bed and not catching on fire, right? So, um, and and yet there was this problem. Okay, it causes <laughs> there's a neurotoxicity that comes with a lot of those inflammables. Uh, we use weed killer to kill off all kinds of weeds. Great, but now the monarch butterflies that um, eat milkweed, um, um, they don't have enough food and monarch butterflies in the next couple of years could become endangered. They're down to less than 10% of their former numbers. Bumblebees are also in trouble. Honeybees are in a whole lot of trouble. Um, it could be, and I'm going to turn this over to Sue now, right, talk for a little while. It could be that our honeybees are trying to tell us that there's a carrying limit for chemicals and that we're there. Um, one of the things that I, I, I before Sue takes over. I just want to show you two studies very, that came out this week. These came out this week, okay? We could show you lots of studies. We could show you, you know, dozens and dozens, hundreds of studies, actually. This one is interesting. Um, it just came out. Um, I just got the, the notice about it yesterday. Uh, this is telling us, it's not about bees, it's talking about how, if you look at the italicized point, overall the results of the study indicate that insecticides pose substantial threats to the biodiversity of global agricultural surface waters, okay? That's not just neonics, it's not just systemics, it's all pesticides, all herbicides. They're, they're poisoning our waters. Could bring up a map, I have it queued here if anybody wants to see it, of the waters in North America, and how they have um, the neonics, the systemic pesticides are in those waters, let alone the other toxins that are in those waters. So that just came out. Um, there's another one here, if I can get my... Uh, computer to behave itself. Okay, let's try that. Okay, this one just came out last week. New York Times reported this. You might have seen it. Uh, a big study done by European scientists linking honeybee, honey, honeybee bee deaths um, to neonicotinoids, but also saying this much more is at danger, in danger rather than just honeybees. And, it's, and their question here, if you look at it here, they, uh, they questioned whether the substances, that is neonicotinoid pesticides, had a place in sustainable agriculture. Um, you know, Europe has put a ban on neonicotinoids, um, and it's probably going to be ongoing, given the research that's come out in recent years. So, um, I'm going to let Sue take over. I'll probably talk again, but I wanted to give you background as to, um, you know, what, what we're doing with chemicals, and just ask you to ask the question whether we should be using chemicals for every single problem that humanity faces. A lot of people, a lot of environmentalists are thinking that it's not the solution to everything. So I just ask you to consider that question. All right, so thinking about pesticides, I'm going to get into the more sort of, you know, more nuts and bolts aspects of it. I mean, Becky is sort of talking at a high level, but, but just to think about the history of, of pesticides. Pesticides have been around for since at least documented to 2000 BC, right? So, you know, we've had pesticides for a long time, and, you know, when thinking about what a pesticide is, it's basically anything that targets a, a, a particular organism, whether that's, um, you know, a rodent, uh, uh, an insect, an herb, um, a, a weed, a, a whatever, a fungus. And so there's lots of different kinds of pesticides, and we're going to mostly focus on sort of the um, insecticides and herbicides piece of pesticides. But pesticide is the broad category. But they've been around for a really long time. Um, it used to be uh, elemental sulfur was dusting. That was what uh, was used initially. Um, other poisonous plants have been used for pest control. Uh, so there's been, uh, it, tobacco was used as a pesticide. So 
a lot of different things have been used. Arsenic-based pesticides were really what was used mostly in the early half of the of the 1900s. It wasn't until after World War II that the sort of current um, generations of, of chemicals really took off and, and developed, and really developed out of um, some of the chemistry that was developed during during the war years. Um, so, you know. That emergence of both uh, a heavy reliance on pesticides as well as the current agricultural system where you have um, uh, farmers, you know, we've all seen the demise of family farms and, and farms getting, getting bigger, so we've got more increasing monoculture of, of, you know, agricultural crops, so, you know, thousands and thousands of acres of a single crop. And, and we've got companies now that are, that are you know, really, um, I, I think, they feel like they're helping the farmers and helping our agricultural system to to be able to produce the, the yields that we want um, from you know and they're helping them from seed to you know from cradle to grave essentially so every aspect of the agricultural system so you know providing them with seeds providing them with pesticides to solve pest problems providing them with fertilizers and all of those kinds of things what happens though is that um, they get locked into uh, this, and also because we have a lot of government subsidies for agriculture too, so that farmers have stopped uh, managing their land with a diversity of crops. They, you know, big farmers typically are, are there. It's one single crop. So when we think about our ecological systems, anybody else here uh, an environmental studies major in college or, you know. Me and, oh yes, of course, I know you were. Um, so I was an environmental studies major in, in college, right? And, and, you know, so studied um, ecology and, you know, the environment. And, you know, what we learned about was, you know, how important biodiversity is and having a diverse array of, uh, you know, all species, uh, they, they, you know, are interconnected. And, and so if you end up with monoculture and monocropping, you, you're reducing the amount of biodiversity there is. Not as good for the environment as, uh, as uh, a broader array of, of diverse organisms and, and species. And so that, that becomes more and more of a problem in agriculture because, you know, if you have thousands of acres have only one crop on them, there's, where are where are insects, where are birds, where are other things that rely on that biodiversity going to go? Where do, you know, their, their, their habitat becomes limited. We've seen that with the monarch butterfly, we've seen that with many other things. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the modern farming techniques of large, what we call, now call conventional agriculture, um, it, it poses a problem. And insecticides and herbicides are a huge part of that problem. So, you know, we think about you know how those things are used. Um, uh, Becky mentioned uh, pre-treated seeds. Well, those pre-treated seeds, to, when you, to break that down, there's a couple of things going on. There might be um, most most corn now grown in this country is GMO corn, which means you know it's genetically modified, and it's genetically modified so that um, it's what's called Roundup ready, so that when they plant it and there are weeds that come up in the in the fields. Uh, the, the corn itself is resistant to Roundup, which is glyphosate, um, and so they can spray it on the fields, kill the weeds, and not kill the corn. Well, we think that's that's a good thing, right? Uh, it may it may not be such a good thing. Um, and the other thing is that the seeds are often pre-treated, and they're pre-treated with the neonic uh, neonicotinoid, which is a systemic pesticide. So that's going after the insects, not the herbs. And, and so when the corn grows up, the insecticide is in all parts of the plant. So it's in everything. And it stays there. It doesn't go away. It doesn't have half-life. It doesn't, you know, it, or it doesn't have that much of a half-life. It doesn't have the half-life that, uh, that an herbicide does, typically. And so it's poisonous, really, for its entire life. So um, now corn, it, bees particularly, they don't particularly go for corn, as, as, so it's not as dangerous. That particular thing is not as dangerous. But you translate that same insecticide that they use on corn to things that you can actually buy over the counter now, uh, at Home Depot, at Lowe's, at wherever, um, that are systemic pesticides, and you spray it on your whatever aphids are you know, getting in your garden, that becomes a problem. Your entire plant becomes poisonous. Um, or if you, same thing, go to Lowe's, go to Home Depot, or go to some certain places where they sell them, and buy bedding plants. You know, you like those petunias, we like those, uh, you know, geraniums, your pansies, whatever. 
uh, to plant in your garden because they're pretty, well, it turns out that more than half of them, and this was determined by a study of actually going and, t and buying plants at these places and testing them, more than half of them have been pre-treated with those same neonicotinoids. So your entire plant, your nice pretty flower that's going to flower and the bees are going to land on it and pollinate it, turns out that it's been pre-treated with a poison. So the entire plant is poisonous. So my bees, Becky's bees, your bees if you have them, might be landing on that plant and then go back to their hive and they're taking some of that pesticide with them. Now, again, we, know, we don't know that those pesticides are directly killing bees, but they certainly, um, these pesticides, the way they work, pretty much all of them nowadays are, they're neurotoxins. So they're affecting the neural pathways of whatever the insect is and they do it in different ways. I'm not gonna go into the science of that because that really is pretty deadly boring. Um, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a neurotoxin, and uh, it, it affects their ability to navigate. So bees, which you know live in a collective hive, um, they get out there, they have some of this pesticide, they take it back to their to their hive. Um, now suddenly you have that pesticide in the in the pollen and the nectar that the knees, the bees are bringing back. It, it's in the wax. Um, it starts to affect their ability to navigate. So if they go out there and they're going out to collect more pollen, um, they may not be able to get back to their hive. And that, that is thought to be one of the reasons why um, the hives are, are dying off, is because the bees get out there and, and they're, they're having this chronic exposure to uh, pesticides and they, they lose their ability to, to navigate their way back. Um, and, and think about, too, then, those same pesticides that are neurotoxins on the corn, and that corn is going into our food and it doesn't really have a half-life, so the food that we're eating, that corn that we're eating, we're eating it. So what is happening to people? And I think that's a, another piece, and there's a variety of studies that, that um, there's, there's studies that in, and the science, you'll, you'll see science on all sides of this issue. So I'm not saying that the definitive science says that all of these things are poisonous for people and for pollinators, there's science on the other side that'll say the other, the opposite. Um, but there's a lot of scientific studies that are coming out increasingly saying that these poisons are, are also, that are in our food system and in our water systems, are poisonous to people as well. And, you know, we're hear hearing more about possible links to autism, to ADHD, chronic exposures, of course, to cancers, and, and all of those kinds of things. And, you know, just in the last couple of months, uh, the, the, the stuff that's coming out is, is pretty amazing and, it, and it's, you know, the, the stacking up. World Health Organization, that's a, generally a pretty respected um, international body, just said um, that uh, glyphosate, which is Roundup, which, um, how many people here have applied Roundup at some point in your life? At some point in your life, okay. I don't mean yesterday, but at some point I've, I've but you know, applied it at one point. Um, that that is a, they have four levels of categorization of, of you know how they categorize these chemicals, but they've now uh, put it in in category two, which is probably cancerous, um, which is uh, the next to the highest level of, of sort of dangerous toxicity. That was just what a, a month ago, is that right? Two, three weeks. Ago. Um, the EPA. The EPA is the body in the U.S. that regulates uh, pesticides and authorizes them for, for use. They just said that they are, you know, this is just a little tiny step, but they just said that they're not going to allow for new, new uses of neonicotinoids on the market until more study has been done. Now, Europe, of course, already put a moratorium on, on many of these chemicals, or at least the three big ones, um, until more studies have been done. Um, but the EPA just did that, uh, I think that was last week. And, you know, that doesn't affect the 100 or so products that are already out there, that are already in use, but they're not going to authorize them for new uses, which is, which is encouraging news. So we've got a lot of stuff going on here in this world, and the data is, is uh, mounting about the dangers of, of these chemicals. So, um, so why should we care about this? I mean, I've already mentioned the biodiversity issues and the human health issues, and, and you know, why should we care about pollinators? And, and let me define pollinators first, too, because um, pollinators, you know, oftentimes people think pollinator, honeybee. Um, well, honeybee is pollinator for sure, and it's probably the most charismatic and, and well-known in addition to the monarch butterfly. But, you know, anything that pollinates a plant is a pollinator. So humans are pollinators to some degree. Um, butterflies, uh, honeybees as well as native bees, um, beetles, birds, 
lots of different things can be pollinators. Basically, anything that moves the pollen to you know, make a plant, uh, you know, fertilize a plant. So if you remember your high school biology, that's basically, you know, how it works. So why do we care about this? Well, the European honeybee, which is the honeybee that we all know, uh, is an introduced species. It's not a native species to the U.S. It, it was introduced, but it was introduced at the same time as most of our standard food crops. So our food crops that we all eat, uh, they were developed relying on bees to pollinate them. So, you know, Pretty much about one out of every three bites of food you take is pollinated by a honeybee. And so if the honeybees are dying off, that's a problem. Uh, it's a big problem for agriculture. And agriculture oftentimes, you know, they get into that cycle and they're not thinking, oh, this is a problem. And in fact, Monsanto is trying to um, design uh, breeds or, or particular types of, of um, seeds and plants that don't need that kind of external pollination so that they don't need honeybees anymore. But, you know, think about almonds. Okay, here, who eats almonds here? Anybody eaten an almond in the last couple of days? I just had some an hour ago. Okay, yeah, right. Almonds. So almonds, good. thousands and thousands of acres of almonds in California. Um, beautiful trees, and they all, you know, bloom in the springtime. Well, those trees, pretty much all of them, are pollinated by bees that are trucked in from all over the country for the few week period that the almond trees are in bloom. And so, um, you know, all of your almonds rely on the honeybee industry, commercial beekeepers trucking thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of hives across the country to those almond orchards. What's a little bit short-sighted about that sometimes is that um, the almond uh, growers will oftentimes spray their trees with pesticides. And they will spray their trees with pesticide, for pesticides when uh, the trees are in bloom and the bees are on them. So last year they killed I think it was like 80,000 hives died in the almond orchards um, because they sprayed pesticides when the bees were actually on the flowers. Now, that to me seems a little short-sighted if you need those bees to pollinate your plants, but it happens. Um, uh, you know, Becky mentioned, um, did you mention cosmetic pesticides? I, know. I no. did not. Oh, no, you didn't. Okay, cosmetic pesticides. So this is just an example. Um, uh, a couple years ago, in a parking lot of a Target, I believe it was, in Oregon, um, people's cars were being dumped with um, basically aphid poop. So, you know, aphid, it's called honeydew, I think, is what the people call it, but it's basically, okay. So, um, enough about that, I know you're eating lunch, but, um, so people didn't like that. They didn't like that their cars were covered with this droppings from the aphids. So, uh, the, the company uh, contracted with a tree company to come out and spray the trees. And what happened was they sprayed the trees while they were in bloom. And so bumblebees were on the trees at the time. And so uh, within hours, the parking lot is littered with tens of thousands of honeybees, of, of bumblebees, just dead, died on contact. Um, and, you know, so all these people who were complaining about their cars being covered with um, honeydew from the aphids, now we're covered with um, dead bumblebees. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, not, that's not an isolated incident. It, those kinds of things happen a lot. So, so, you know, we have to think about those things because bumblebees also are a pollinator. Uh, they're, they're an important pollinator. So that's why we need to be caring about, uh, about pollinator health as well as human health, um, is that, you know, pollinators are responsible for a lot of the food we eat and for, for what we do. But there's a lot of challenges around this. So um, uh, Becky mentioned the water study. There's another study that uh, um, of eight uh, Midwestern states adjacent to Colorado here where the USGS did a study of, of uh, neonicotinoids in the water supply, um, or, or in waterways that feed the water supply, uh, because these things are water soluble. So what happens is that agriculture runoff, as well as urban runoff, were, are, they found, uh, you know, above lethal uh, levels of neonicotinoids in waterways, in a significant number of waterways, not all, but significant number. And that included both agricultural runoff as well as urban runoff. Because those neonics are being used in agricultural practices, but we also are using them in our own backyards. And so in the urban piece of it, the runoff, I mean, it's coming from things that our neighbors, all of us in this room, might be spraying on our own plants. Um, because you can buy them over the counter. Uh, so, you know, that's a problem. Um, Another issue, you know, invasive weeds. So, you know, we all probably know something about invasive weeds. If nothing else, bindweed in your garden. I mean, everybody know bindweed. You know, it's terrible stuff. Thistles, things like that. You know, you want to get rid of them. A lot of people want to get rid of dandelions. So, 
you know, invasive weeds to get rid of them without chemicals is really hard. It requires a lot of plowing, it requires uh, hand digging, it's a lot of labor. It's, it's hard to get rid of them. So, you know, what are, what are land managers supposed to do in terms of treating those over large areas? It's one thing to dig our dandelions in our own backyard. It's another one to think about thistles or something that might be taking over whole agricultural fields or choking out waterways, and that's a much bigger issue. I lived up in the Northwest for a long time, and um, Japanese knotweed, which is a really terrible invasive weed that spreads by rhizomes and you cannot control it and it goes along the waterways, but it chokes out the waterways and uh, reduces habitat for fish and for other uh, aquatic species. Um, you know, spread out of people's gardens. How do you get rid of it? Well, trying to dig, you can't dig it, because if you dig it, like bindweed, uh, every little piece of root will sprout a new plant. So it's a really bad idea to dig it. So how do you get rid of it? And it's right next to waterways. That's a, that, those are huge, huge challenges that land managers face and that all of us face in our own yards. So um, alternatives, you know, biological controls for managing invasive weeds. Well, you think about that, you know, Tamarisk, you know, tamarisk that chokes out waterways, particularly in western Colorado. Uh, you know, there's biological controls, which is uh, some kind of an Asian beetle. Well, you know, they've tested it and tested it and tested it. But, you know, with things like that, you don't know if there's going to be unintended consequences. Remember rabbits in Australia? Mm -hmm. um, you know, but there's some unintended consequences potentially with some biological controls. So those are, that's a huge challenge for land managers. Um, and doing tillage instead of herbicides, you know, it, it, that requires a huge amount of fossil fuel to run the, and, and expense to run your plows, your tractors that are doing the plowing. So for a farmer, that's like really expensive. It's also, you know, adds to, you know, their carbon footprint. It's, you know, use of fossil fuels. So, I don't know, herbicides, fossil fuels, that's, that becomes a really difficult uh, equation. Drift. And then there's the high cost of uh, drift is, you know, pesticides drifting over to other, other um, lands that, you know, may not want those pesticides. That's another huge challenge to deal with. Um, and there's the high cost of converting to organics. I mean, you know, the county deals with that on a regular basis. They've got, you know, 16,000 acres for, of agricultural lands, um, and they want them to be organic, but they put out an RFP to have farmers uh, you know, take them over and convert them to organic, and they don't get any bids because it's way too expensive. That's a huge challenge. How do we deal with that? Um, these are just, I'm just sort of listing some of the, the societal challenges that, that we've got around, around our addiction to chemicals and how do we uh, step back from that addiction in a way that makes some sense. So I'm gonna go into public policy for just a moment to cover sort of some of the things that are happening um, on the public policy front. We've talked about the fact that you know, a lot of European countries have a moratorium. The, the World Health Organization classification of glyphosate, which I think is going to be a, a potentially a, a really big issue, uh, you know, the more that gets out. But on the federal level, um, in 2013, a federal bill was introduced called Saving America's Pollinators Act. It was just reauthorized last month, and that is also about you know trying to address this, particularly the neonicotinoids. But I have to say about neonicotinoids is that that's sort of become the hot button issue. But the reality is that the pesticide companies are already on to their next pesticide, so that's you know, by the time, you know, public consciousness gets on the neonics, the next great thing is already out there. Um, and, you know, we'll have to be thinking about that one. Last spring, about a year ago, Obama um, did a presidential memorandum on pollinator health and so uh, asked his agencies to come up with a plan to protect pollinators. So, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, that plan isn't out yet, but it's it's coming. So we'll see what happens with that with the USDA and, and uh uh, the EPA. Uh, in fact, some of us were back in Washington, D.C., happened to be there when uh, the USDA was having a listening session on this issue, and so we testified. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of testimony there from both sides, industry as well as those of us who were concerned about these things. Um, at the state level, the Pesticide Applicators Act, uh, which, is the, which is up for sunset review this year, is only reviewed every 10 years. This is the act that regulates um, pesticide applicators, those who put pesticides out there, um, sometimes in schools and hospitals, but on agricultural lands. So that's up for, for sunset review. Um, and it's in the legislature in the House right now as we speak, and our own Casey Becker is, uh, is the sponsor of the bill in the, in the House. And it, and it has to get reauthorized uh, in order for the regulatory program 
that the Colorado Department of Agriculture uh, administers to, to monitor applicators. But um, that's, a, that's a big thing that's, that's happening right now. The Colorado Department of Agriculture has oversight over applicators throughout the state. Um, and we want them to enforce the rules to make sure that you know, people who are applying are applying properly. Um, at the local level, the state has preemption. So that means that at the local level, like here in Boulder, we have a resolution going through our city council to protect, you know, the be safe resolution. But they can't actually pass an ordinance because the state, it's state law preempts local control over that. So at the state level, um, that, that's where the control is. Locally, we can't pass an ordinance banning anything, even if we want to. So, um, you know, that's kind of an issue. So that brings me down then to what can we do? What, how can we have influence? Well, that's speaking of legislative activities. One of the things we can do is we can be talking to our legislators and telling them if if you're concerned about pesticides, make sure that they know that, and make sure that they that's on their radar and that they think about that issue. Ask questions. Ask, ask, ask. I mean, that's my biggest thing is ask a lot of questions. So when you go to buy plants, find out have they been treated, and don't just ask one person in the store. Ask multiple people because most of the employees at most stores where you buy stuff, they don't know. They haven't been trained. But ask them. Ask them if they've asked their wholesaler where they get their plants from, whether they treated with pesticides. There's very few places here in Boulder that um, actually can really say that they sell plants that aren't pre-treated with, with pesticides. Um, Harlequin's Gardens is one. Um, McGuckin's has taken the pledge, but I think they do have some things that have been pre-treated. Home Depot now is actually, uh, in a way, promoting neonicotinoid treated plants by putting a label on them that says, um, this plant has been protected from aphids, white fly, and something else um, scales. By, by being, what is it? Scales. Scales, yeah. Mm -hmm. By being treated with um, neonicotinoids. So they're sort of saying, oh, we protected this plant for you and we treated it without people necessarily knowing what that means. Um, but so ask a lot of questions. Um, Buy pollinator friendly plants because one of the things about bees and pollinators is that they need forage. They need stuff to eat. They need groceries. So we don't have enough. I mean, you know, frequently what happens along the roadways is they just mow down all the flowers. They mow everything in sight because people like everything to be neat and tidy. Well, you know, we need those plants and the bees need those plants because agriculture has pretty much that mono agriculture thing that we talked about earlier. Uh, you know, that's taken out all of the things that bees eat. So their grocery store has, has decreased dramatically. So you know, when our, when our um, county and our cities and our state mow roadways and, and take, get rid of all those, those things that we think of as weeds, that's actually the grocery store for, uh, for pollinators. So you know, if you can plant pollinator-friendly plants in your yard, that really helps a lot. Um, think about your indoor pesticide use. You know, anybody use decon or you know things like that? You know, pesticides might be in your hand sanitizer, it might be in your laundry soap, it might be in your dish soap. It could be anywhere. So you know, think about what you use. Read your labels. Um, the Be Safe Neighborhood Movement that you probably have heard some some about here in 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 Boulder. Uh, you know, take the pledge to be pesticide free yourself. Uh, ask your neighbors to take the pledge. Uh, join up with with groups like that. Join up with groups like our group, the People in Pollinators Action Network. We're more in the public policy realm, less on the neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor organizing realm, but, um, you know, get involved. Read labels. Read labels on everything you, you are applying, and if you don't know what it is, look it up. You know, know what you're applying. I mean, a lot of us, you know, it's, oh, this is, this is advertised on TV. It's, it's going to solve this problem. We need to know what it is that they're advertising because, you know, the companies that advertise this stuff really have a lot of money to, to spend on that kind of stuff. Um, talk to your kids' school district about their policies. You know, Boulder Valley School District has really good policies, but still, you know, they can always do better too. Kids' schools, are you concerned about your kids' exposure to, to pesticides? If you're, if you're a business owner yourself or you have an employer that has a campus, talk to them about their landscaping practices. Talk to the city and county about, about that. But and lastly, talk to your lawn and tree care companies. Emerald ash borer has been found in the city of Boulder. Um, Emerald ash borer will kill ash trees. We have a lot of ash trees in, in Boulder. So what's happening is that the tree care companies just come in and say, oh, we'll take care of this for you. Well, what they're doing is they're spraying systemic neonics on those ash trees to protect them and to keep them from dying. Which one, it's not necessarily going to keep them from dying in the long run because um, emerald ash borer is pretty strong and pretty virulent, virulent. So there's no guarantee that imidacloprid or other things that they spray is going to actually solve the problem. And um, 
you know, then it becomes a systemic poison. So your whole tree then becomes poisonous to pollinators. So, but ask what they're applying because all the time they'll just come to you and say, oh, well, we'll take care of it for you. Don't worry. You know, don't worry. Especially, you know, a lot of people, well, don't worry, you pretty little head. It'll be just fine. So that's what they do. Lawn care companies too. I mean, they'll just say, you know, oh, we'll take care of your lawn. Don't worry. Uh, well, you know, know what they're doing because they're working for you. So if you don't want them to do it, ask a lot of questions. So there are a lot of things that we can do. And I'm going to stop there. Sorry, I probably <laughs> went on too long. So now I do questions. Uh, on the on board of an HOA oh, in yeah. South Boulder. And we wrestle with this all the time. And uh, there's a group that is so strong in this direction of anti pesticide, anti insecticides, everything, right? Majority wants a nice Kentucky bluegrass, whatever it's called, lawn, right? Now, which I understand. And they keep bringing up organic solutions. We look around and around, there's no such thing as an effective, that we've found, organic solution to this problem. And in fact, you mentioned that state preemption, but the city itself, what they do to their own open space, I presume, is probably the, is probably the most aggressive in terms of uh, saving, the, saving the environment. But so many of their areas look crappy. You, know, you see dandelions all over the place. Other than going out and digging them up, like you alluded to earlier, what do you do? Because these organic solutions, from everything I've seen, just don't do it. What is, you know, what is sort of education in convincing people that, you know, dandelions aren't that bad, for one thing. My bees love dandelions, so, you know, that's one thing. But, you know, that's hard to... You sound like a vocal minority, by the way. It's hard, to, it's hard to tell people that, because people, you know, we've been all been sort of brainwashed to think that the only lawn is an absolutely perfectly green lawn with nothing bad in it. You know, remember, I mean, probably when you were a kid, when I was a kid, anyway, we, um, you know, we ran around and you, you couldn't, you, it was kind of scary to run around barefoot because there was so much clover in the lawn, and when the clover was, was blooming, you know, it might get a bee sting, right? Um, well, you know, we've been, now been brainwashed to think that clover's really bad. Uh, dandelions are really bad. So, so one thing is just sort of rethinking how we think about lawns. But there are organic solutions. There are some. I mean, one thing that I used to use uh, for um, uh, uh, dandelions to, is a pre-emergent uh, cornmeal gluten, which, well, then you think, well, okay, corn probably has pesticides. So, you know, I'm not sure it's completely pesticide-free. There's probably residues in there. But cornmeal gluten actually is a pre-emergent um, uh, kind of thing. Would you that down so I can actually take that forward? Sure. Forward? Sure. Cornmeal gluten works. Um, uh, cornmeal, like think about you know cornbread, <laughs> cornmeal gluten, and they sell it. At, they sell it at McGuckins. They're probably sold out because <laughs> so many people use it. Um, so and then and there are other organic products that can be used, but the problem is they're more expensive. So they're more expensive, and so for your HOA, that's not, that's not the issue that we're facing. Okay, so your HOA isn't necessarily concerned about that issue so much, but there are solutions, and there are companies actually that only use organic solutions for some of these things. The city of Boulder manages its turf um, organically and has for years, so they they're able to do it. Um, but there's a it's, a it's a theory called the integrated pest management, which is using the least toxic method first. And so you know you need to work with a, a company that uses integrated pest management practices, um, which is it, which actually results often in a better in a better landscaping anywhere. Park there, Bear Mountain and Lehigh, it's full of dandelions. That's taken care of by the city so we pass that and say you're kidding me what the city is doing is not working mm -hmm. from the perspective of the majority who want a decent looking lawn yeah, right. you may want to call um, the city and talk to Vela Abernathy or someone like her she's the integrated pest management coordinator city of Boulder we're one of the few cities in the world maybe a galaxy that has an inter integrated pest management person but um, she would tell you if she were here that Boulder has won the um, what is it? The it's athletic, fields, athletic of the fields of the year award for its soccer fields and playing fields that are all weed free. It's not the organic athletic fields award of the year. It's the athletic fields of the. I didn't even know it existed, right? Athletic field of the weed year right. award. What's her, and name it, again? Uh, her, uh, her name is Rella Abernathy. Rella Abernathy. Rella Abernathy, right. She works for the city of Right, Boulder. she works for the city of Boulder, And right. she is the integrated pest management person. Right, and she can tell you, she can connect you up with a fellow who's back in New York who came out and spoke for our group once upon a time, well, actually last August, 
about how you can have it, that beautiful glowing green field that's largely weed free. One of the things you want to do, I, our next door neighbor I like very much, he uses pesticides and herbicides all the time. Our grass looks better than his and believe me we don't do anything special for our grass. I'm not a grass sort of gal, I'm pulling up as much of it as possible, putting in um, and flowers and such. What he's done is he's killed the soil. It's, he's used the herbicides and the pesticides so much that the soil doesn't have worms, it doesn't have the bacteria, it doesn't have the hummus, it doesn't have the stuff that soil needs to grow good stuff. Mm -hmm. So he, I don't know how many times he's replaced his grass in the time he's lived next door, next door to us, like two times, three times. And then there's the sprinkler problems and he hates mowing. He, he has a nightmare life because of his yard, actually. <laughs> um, and maybe all of us do, right? Um, I think he'd be, uh, but in any case, our grass looks better than his right now. It looks better than his. And so, the, his solution, which is the mainstream solution, is not working very well. And that's really common. My takeaway is no call. Okay. Call Rella. Yeah. Call Rella, yeah. yeah. You mentioned mowing the roadways and the, and the ditches and everything in, in Boulder County. Lady Bird Johnson, years ago, started the wildlife program, or wildflower Wild program, program, in the mediums. And you drive through a lot of states, through the Midwest and in the South and even in the Northeast, and you see hundreds of wildflowers all summer long, and we mow them all down. What can we do here in Colorado to propagate that? We don't have a road management plan in Colorado. We don't. That, you know, they mow right. it. I, I see beautiful stuff growing, and then the next yeah. thing I know, somebody's mowed it all down. They'll spray herbicide all along the truck. Yeah, they will. The truck. Right. Well, yeah. Well, that's really, that's our role really in the, in this is to, to do as much pu public policy work as we can and that's definitely on our on our agenda is to go after them. We're doing a lot of local stuff right now, yeah. like City of Boulder, Boulder County, Longmont. We're going to be in Fort Collins. We're um, you know we're we're addressing uh, local local issues as well as the state legislative issues with the Pesticide Applicators Act. But CDOT's definitely on our radar to go, radar to go after to try and develop a a state um, roadway management plan that's managed for uh, forage and that provides that balance between beauty and, uh, you know, what people expect and want and, you know, having, it's so easy having forage. It's I mean, I've seen it, you know, and it, and it saves in the mowing costs. Exactly. And stuff. Well, right. Longmont's had a big issue just in the last couple of weeks is that a couple, group of homeowners who are adjacent to the rough and ready ditch uh, are mad because the, the, the city stopped mowing the ditch and is trying to manage it for native plants now. And the people adjacent to it, they don't like that. They want it to go back to being pristine and green. Well, it has saved the city of Longmont hundreds of thousands of dollars in the last five years since they've been doing that. So well, there's a big tension there. Well, what do you do? You got people who want this green and pristine, and you got people who, you know, want the native. Well, if you educate them, I think that's the key. Yeah. But one, one other question, real quick. What about when they spray for mosquitoes? Doesn't it kill everything else? Not as much yeah. as you might think. Yeah. I mean, it's, it just horrifies me. I'm like, because ah, I'm a very organic gardener. Really? In fact, your, your discussion about your better lawn, mm -hmm. I had an amazing lawn in Massachusetts, and the only thing it ever got treated with was milky spore mm -hmm. <laughs> because right. of the grubs. Right. But beyond that, it was organic, right. very organic, right. and it, it was beautiful. Right. The, the mosquito spraying is, I mean, it's a, it's a, that's a tough issue because you've got, um, you know, West Nile virus that people are very, con you know, concerned, rightfully right. so. Yeah. And so how do we, you know, how do we manage for that? Um, but mosquito spraying is not quite as toxic as, as some of the other things that, can, that are sprayed are. And they're fairly targeted uh, sprays just at mosquitoes, so they don't necessarily um, kill everything, but they do kill, kill some other aquatic uh, insects that, that, uh, that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. But um, that's that's one of those really tough issues. How do you manage, you know, like the invasive weed issue? How do you manage, you know, when you've got something that's really legitimately a disease? It's the same issue with malaria in in you know tropical countries where they're still using DDT and people are still spraying DDT on in the ins, you know inside their homes, mm -hmm. um, and they're pr you know protecting themselves from malaria. Well, what do you you know what do you do? But that's it's hard. I mean, you know, I don't want to say, oh, don't spray, get malaria instead. Right. Yeah. That's not a good idea. Yeah. I want to go back to the forage question that you asked about, because that's something we can really do something about, right? Um, I have, I had my bees and hope to replace them this spring, but um, I called up the city of Boulder about two years, three years ago, I guess it is when I first got them. Because there's a bunch of, there's um, a bike trail that runs behind my house and alfalfa grows, grows on either side of it. And alfalfa is, is a wonderful food for bees. And um, uh, they would mow it though. And, and, and they would mow it 
with a with a zeal that was admirable. Actually, um, they would, you know, it's like why do we need you know 35 feet of open you know open area on either side of the um, bike trail? And it was it was touching to see they're so devoted to their work. But still, you know, I called the city and said, um, look, can you not mow as much? Mow right next to the bike trail. There's a little running path there. Fine, do that. Can you leave the rest of the alfalfa for my bees? And they did for two years. Last year, they mowed it again, um, and they did it with that zeal again. Um, and so my bees had less to eat. Um, did that help, you know, um, kill my bees? I, it didn't help, uh, you know, um, that's for sure. So, uh, yeah, you can do that. You can call, and they do listen, and you can write letters as well. I noticed actually a letter to the editor in the camera just very recently on that issue, on the forage issue. So I think if we get the word out about things like that, we and, and again, this comes down to these these little but really big cultural expectations, right? Right. Chemicals are a solution to everything, aren't they? Well, chemicals, my point is, chemicals are not a solution to every problem. Um, we, and the other cultural thing we need to think about is, what do we define as beautiful? So lots of people have been saying for an awful long time that Kentucky bluegrass lawns don't belong in the West, right? They come from Kentucky, which gets a whole lot more water than we do, right? <laughs> so we need to redefine what's beautiful in the West. And um, for some reason, that mode, sort of stubbly brown look became popular and to, with CDOT, um, Color Department of Transportation. Right? Why are we doing that? That's ugly. I've seen them mow down really beautiful blue flax, the wild blue oh, flax. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and it the just. Sun, the, the, um, the sunflowers, you know, the yeah, the, the clovers, yeah, the, and these are a lot of these are natives, and you're going, why are we doing that? Well, well think about think about water. Yeah, it's because of the it is because yeah, it's of like the it's it's the, the ideology, ideology. And, and this is you know my point. And there's a whole generation generations of people who grew up with these expectations, right? You know, and when I was growing up on Saturdays, we kids we mowed the lawn. That's what we did. We, um, we and you you kept it that long. We played in our yard because it's a big yard, but um, and that was an expectation. But did that make sense in the West? Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But it's an ideology. It's a cultural thing, and so now we have these expectations. It's very difficult to change those. But well, but think about California. I mean, California right. is oh. experiencing major drought. Right? They got a year of water, um, left. and we're going to be experiencing. Yeah. I mean, we're already. Well, maybe not they're going to change but, their expectations. You know, we got, we got drought right. here in Colorado. Right. So you know, in California, oh. what they're seeing is well, people are having to take their lawns out and they're having to you know do something else and not have those you know brilliant green lawns. And in the arid west, that's probably a better idea to look a little bit more like New Mexico and Arizona than to try and have big expanses of, of bright green lawn. It just doesn't really make any sense in this in this um, climate. Or just use a different type of turf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There that are too. there are turfs that can do well here. Yeah, buffalo yeah. grass instead of right. Kentucky bluegrass. Right. Sure. Oak. Oh, oh, I was just going to say that Walt Roberts, when when he developed. Uh, and car, he said, we're not going to have any lawns. We're yeah. going to let the grass grow up, the native grasses, and it, it looks great. Yeah, a lot of people go up there every single day to hike. Yeah, must be, so must be doing something right. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry. Over here. In terms of um, the history of residential lawns and landscaping, um, I've heard it. Uh, I've heard that prior to World War II. The normal culture was to use your lawn and landscaping actually for food production. Yeah. And it wasn't until after World War II that this changed. So right. the premise that this is something that we've always done is really not correct. Mm -hmm. It's something that just started post-World War II. A lot it's, of things started post-World War II. Yeah. There's a reason we yeah. use that term, post-World War But you know, you're right. The Victory Gardens during the Second exactly. World War were very important. And right. um, you know, there are those who predict we're going to go back to that. Um, right. I'm happy enough. I produce a lot of food in my backyard, a lot of it actually kind of rots because I don't ever get to it, right? So the little birds get the get those things, right? Well, but, um, think yeah. about post-World War II in terms of the advent of modern pesticides and modern fertilizers. Right. They go hand in hand, these, these issues. Right, and right. of course there are neighborhoods, not necessarily around here, but there are we, we came from Florida, and in Florida, in a lot of neighborhoods, you were prohibited from using your lawn, your landscaping to grow food. Right, right. Food. yeah, so that there's, Florida. There's Florida, it's now illegal for a state employee to say the word climate change, yeah. right? Yes. So I don't think we should use Florida <laughs> as our as our measuring. Mm -hmm. Right. They call it nuisance flooding. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. That works too. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Watching tape.